That's in my so, Now I've got, um, now I'm taking another deep dive into it, another attempt, and I've got a mirrorless. And um, supposedly that, that's um, the creme de la creme for, for infrared. Yep. Mm -hmm. in, in a few minutes, you'll see I have a couple of slides that uh, deal with that exact issue. And I think cool. I know what you were probably struggling mm -hmm. with. And I bring up kind of what my gear is also in that. It's a Nikon Z5 mm -hmm. mirrorless camera. Yeah. And I also had full spec. I had it converted to full spectrum. Oh, okay. And I have the 590 and the 720. And then, you know, with that full, full spectrum, then you have that other filter that will convert it to the back to the normal wavelength. Yeah. Um, they're all external filters. Uh, right, okay. right, right, mm. right, right. I, I was trying to see about getting my an old Nikon uh, D8 converted, and the company I was communicating with in Australia didn't recommend it because uh, Nikon doesn't support um, replacement of some things that could go wrong. So I was very glad that they were honest about that and didn't go ahead and charge me hundreds and hundreds of dollars. But I'm well, not sure what. It, it voids your warranty. That's well, but I the, don't do, have a do they do the conversions? Just, no, I they do. Oh, they don't. Okay. So they at least they don't. Okay. Because I'm like, how can they yeah, tell you to void I the warranty and then do the conversion? Okay. It. Right. 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 Do it with um, with just the point and shoot ones. Right. What? The, the, the um, you know, like a little Lumix, Panasonic, Sonic. Can you do I mean, can that? did you just say oh, can, oh, oh, can you, you can, can you can you do that if it's if it's a matter of um, you know with a conversion where they put a filter over the um, uh, sensor I would think they could do that although you know you I mean typically they would remove the lens to access the sensor and then that's where they would put that filter on mm -hmm. and they do that same thing with a point <clears throat> I would imagine there's just a different way of getting to the sensor but I would think they could but. I don't have the full answer to that one. Okay. I have a uh, Canon G10. Like it's a basically a point and shoot, like with it, the lens retracts in and extends out. And they were able to convert that. And okay. I had to convert it over to the 8, 820. So it's the deep black and white. Yeah. And yeah. I, I'm in love with it. Okay. And I, have two, I have two other conversions in like the 720, you know, range. And one was one just fell on my lap because I was at a used camera place, and I was there for an infrared class. And the the guy the guy said, "Oh, we just got one in on a trade. I think they want fifty dollars for it. Uh, it, it was an old Olympus. Oh yeah, and, and it had a lens, everything. So I'm like fifty dollars. <laughs> <laughs> and and it gave you that. Uh, you said the eight uh, eight something nanometer. Yeah, uh, the eight twenty nanometer. Twenty. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's the. Uh, my G10, and I like. I really love the, how dark the blacks get, and how you know. And, and uh, Contrasting. I never really had any luck with the, with the uh, false color, but like my other ones are 720s, so I don't even know if I can really get false color with that, you know. Right, right, right. Yeah, mine's a 720. I'll kind of go through what uh, what I have, but it sounds like you have plenty of uh, experience with them, so you you may be able to answer some of the questions that I am unable to answer or, or <laughs> write on some of the things I don't know. I've, I've read so many books and it all comes down to you have to get out and experiment. <laughs> yeah, and that's that's what it really comes down to. Yeah. I well, we, I, we can get started. I think sure. it's about, it's like not quite, it's eight after. So if somebody okay. else pops in, that's fine. But um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with Mike, Mike, Michael, mm -hmm. he writes for Photofocus. And uh, like he just said, he's been doing infrared for a couple of years now, um, 20, what year is it? Yeah, 20, so two years basically, right? Um, and offered to do this presentation for us for uh, on infrared photography. So if you, uh, whatever you're ready to start, it's all yours. Sure, sure. I'll go ahead and uh, share my screen here. Let's see, make sure I get the right one again. And also while he's doing that, if you guys have questions, he's okay with you interrupting. Or yeah. if you don't wanna interrupt and you wanna put a question in the chat, then I'll interrupt him, you know, which either way. Um, one of us will see it and uh, hopefully answer your questions instead of waiting waiting till the end or whatever. So then we can just yeah. talk about it when it happens. Yeah, definitely feel free to uh, you know raise your hand or shout out or whatever and so forth. I don't. I, it, it, I actually enjoy the uh, the back and forth discussion rather than waiting all the way to the end if if you have any questions in that. So did that uh, come up? Is that is that? Yes. Yes. 
Okay, great. So uh, first of all, I wanted to thank everybody tonight for joining uh, this presentation. Uh, I, I've learned so much just from the photo focus community, other photo fo groups that I belong to. I've been, uh, had a camera. First one I got was about six and a half years ago. I got it to do a lot of my, uh, I, I do a lot of fly fishing and hiking and outdoor activities. And I wanted to capture some of those images without just my iPhone. And so picked up a camera joined a local camera club, uh, I've been uh, president, I was president of the Lone Tree Photography Club 2020 and 2021, and currently president of the Professional Photographers of Colorado out here in Colorado. So naturally I live in Highlands Ranch, Colorado, and um, still like to spend a lot of time outdoors. And I'll go through here as far as the infrared uh, photography as, um, as, as Lori was mentioning in that, I started that in October, 2020. At the time, I didn't even really know much about what infrared photography was. I was encouraged by a wedding photographer out of California, Troy Miller, who introduced me to it. He suggested that I get a camera, get it converted and so forth and that into uh, infrared. I had seen some of his images and was, was really impressed. So what I did was rather than convert an existing camera I had a couple of DSLRs and was considering that. His suggestion was that I go with a mirrorless camera, so which I didn't have. So I got a, a Nikon Z5 mirrorless camera and had that converted through a company out of Utah, Spencer's camera. There's different places you can get these, you know, those done. Um, a few minutes ago, we were talking about the um, the conversions and that mine's a 720 nanometer, which is, I'm gonna say, somewhat standard. I think probably, I'm guessing probably 75% of converted cameras out there are at that uh, range, that frequency. Uh, and I also want to give credit to, to my wife who had, when I got that camera, I, was, I wasn't expecting to get a new camera at the time. And all of a sudden I wanted to get one for infrared. So it was the story of uh, thinking about getting a new camera phrase came up. And um, <laughs> this was just shortly after having purchased a Nikon D850. At that time, I had said, it'll be a while before I get another camera. So be careful not to define what a while is. <laughs> and then uh, naturally, uh, not too long after that, I got the Nikon Z72 camera because I was impressed with the uh, mirrorless aspect of it. So anyways, I, I think I'm pretty well set with cameras now for a while. <laughs> Okay, let's go. This, just a quick overview of what I'm going to be covering tonight. One is just a, a quick brief overview of what infrared photography is uh, and how and why the images look different uh, from tra traditional photos. And then also want to cover some of what scenarios and subjects works well with infrared. But I also want to cover a few of the ones that, at least in my opinion, haven't necessarily worked that well or I you know, wouldn't necessarily encourage using it for. Um, I'll also go through just some of the infrared photography basics, camera conversions versus specialized filters. Uh, we already talked a little bit here about mirrorless camera versus the DSLR. And then just go through some of the things such as camera settings, white balance, histograms, et cetera. Uh, let's see here. So as far as a couple of the resources that I've used, um, one is uh, there's a book, uh, Infrared Photography. It's just a couple of years old. Uh, Digital Techniques for Artistic Images by Lori Klein, Kyle Klein, and Shelley Vandergrift. And another resource that I use periodically is the company that did my uh, infrared conversion, and that is Spencer's Camera out of Utah, and that's the, the link to, to them. As far as, um, uh, let's see, I guess that's on a different screen. Uh, I, I will I was jumping forward to the next one. Infrared considerations and uses for the following. I'm gonna go over landscape and nature, a uh, little bit of people and animals, not a lot on that one, a little bit of architecture, buildings and cityscapes, and then uh, post-processing. I tend to use Lightroom into Photoshop and then mix Silver Effects Pro. Although I've, I've also lately been uh, doing some of those in Capture One and like some of the features that are there. So resources, this one right here, I, that, I'll, I'll leave that screen up here for a second, but I already just covered that in that I was one slide ahead when I was discussing this one here. Again, the website to Spencer's camera is on there. And then the book that I referenced, that's been one of my- Get him out. 
Okay, so now we'll go into uh, to, to what is infrared photography. Um, just by definition, infra is Latin for below. And then the color red is, I guess that's it, color red, so below red. And with this infrared light falls on the total light spectrum below the red portion. And when we think about infrared light, we're considering what light gets absorbed versus what light gets reflected. And so whereas reflected light, uh, the area appears lighter than normal, what our eyes normally see and what we normally see in photographs. And then when the infrared light is absorbed, the area appears darker than normal. A couple of examples of that is uh, are that um, I'll say leaves, foliage, anything with chlorophyll in it tends to be on the uh, reflected side that reflects infrared light. So it becomes much lighter than what we normally would see. And then absorbed light happen, occurs frequently with, um, uh, let's say like blue sky. I, I think that's the, the best example I can bring up that a blue sky absorbs light. And so in infrared scenes, it, it comes up much darker. And so the combination of uh, the infrared uh, light that's reflected versus the infrared light that's absorbed tends to add more contrast to the scene than what we normally see in our other images. Uh, as far as original uses of infrared, uh, originated back in 1910 by a physicist named Robert Wood, became uh, a little bit more popular when Eastman Kodak's Walter Clark began working with it with the U.S. Army, and in that in the, in in that uh, timeline, they were they, it, they developed uses for aerial surveillance, and then it really became popular for uh, astronomers in that for celestial objects, it provided views that were not there to the uh, the human eye. Uh, infrared pop, uh, photography gained additional popularity later in the 1960s. I think there were probably some other influences involved <laughs> at the time, but uh, you have, if if you remember, for for those of us who are old enough. Uh, some of the old, I'll say, uh, album covers for music and some of those kind of things <laughs> and so forth, the, the psychedelic look or whatever in that, that was one of the uses. I don't particularly tend to uh, look towards that direction for my photography. I like the, the black and white conversions in that. But for those that use it for you know, some of the other spectrums in that, you can definitely get some really unique looks colors wise and so forth that uh, are kind of, outside of the usual, we'll put it that way. Uh, and then moving forward to what infrared is used for today, a lot of photographers, just still photographers in that, like to uh, capture images that are a little bit unique and uh, stand out a little bit from the crowd. And additionally, the astronomers do continue to use infrared for uh, some of that deep space exploration. Uh, let's see, there we go. Um, on this slide, I have just a, uh, a range of the typical uh, spectrum, the, the frequency choices that you can select for infrared photography. Starting at the top, the first three all have the word color in them. So you have uh, at 470 nanometers, it's hypercolor. 590 is supercolor. 665 is enhanced color. Those color ones are the ones that, like I say, will provide you with some of those unique colors that... Um, Kind of more on that psychedelic uh, type of look in that. The one that I have highlighted here and I have listed as standard and that's the 720 nanometers. Um, I, again, that's the one that I think most people tend to go to. It has a, it, 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 it's very good for conversions to black and white, um, you know, from what you get in camera. And then let's see, I don't have the names here, but I know one of our uh, viewers here tonight has one that he mentioned has the 830 nanometer, which is referred to as super black and white. And while I haven't seen much of those, it sounds, because I like the black and white and I like the contrast, I'm sure you get some very good, strong, uh, contrasty um, images when you're using that frequency. Yes. Uh, let's see here. And then uh, as far as the, a couple different ways to go about it, uh, infrared converted camera versus the, the filters, the screw on filters couple advantages and disadvantages to, to each. Uh, the camera conversion, you know, the things to take into consideration there is one is you're having to dedicate a separate camera for infrared use. So you either have to take a, 
you know, an, an existing camera body, maybe if you've got two or three and there's one you don't use, convert that. Um, or, you know, converting a new camera that, uh, that you have to purchase. And the other cost is uh, the conversion itself. Um, again, I went through Spencer's camera. There's other resources to other companies that will do this also. And typically expect the conversion to be maybe be somewhere in the range of $325 to $400. I think that's kind of in the, in the range that, that, so, that most of them will do that for. I have a question. Sure. Do they make infrared cameras like straight like just straight like just purchase it uh, why now, why do why do you have to convert a camera like why wouldn't they just manufacture infrared cameras yeah yeah good great question M i believe they do not meaning that you know nikon canon uh sony right uh the others and so forth they themselves don't sell them as hmm. infrared cameras I, I, and and I'm, I'm saying this I don't know that a hundred percent right right I, I think some now I, I do think that some of the companies that convert the cameras they 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 might buy some and have them converted and ready to sell there without you having to send it to them and you know your own camera and then send it right back. right I, I, I believe they may have some inventory yeah they may have some inventory that they can do it that way versus you having to send in your own so but there are there are um... Maybe I'm going to have to look because I just looked like who, you know, who's an infrared camera camera manufacturer uh -huh. and there are some, but they're like not Canon and they're not Nikon. They're not Sony, okay. you know, they're Optris and the thermal imaging, you know, so, so maybe Bot specialty, Bot trick, yeah. right. I'm sure they are. Yeah. Maybe there's, you know, certain specialty and maybe right. I'm sure they, they must that. be. And, and they may be that's very interesting. Good. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, it's a great question. And it's something I, hadn't researched so it's something I'll have to um to look into myself yeah um and so that so those are some of the considerations again for the uh the camera conversion is you know it, it, it there is a cost associated with it and there's an extra camera that's associated with it uh the other alternative is uh the infrared filters now these are similar to um you know the screw-on filters that we're familiar with say for uh neutral density or you know, um, polarizing type lenses and that they screw on to the, the front of your lens. So in that case, there's no need for a dedicated camera. It's a much lower cost. And in a moment here, I'll kind of go through some of the, the disadvantages or I'll say limitations of using filters. One is that there's a lot of uh, loss of light. Uh, my understanding is that when you put those infrared filters on the front, it's not too different uh, in terms of light change as say using a, um, a neutral, a, a 10 stop neutral density filter. Mm -hmm. So in doing that, you're sort of limited to those long exposure times that are required. So uh, blurring of subjects, anything that's moving, not just let's say, you know, large moving subjects or whatever, but even if it's say a little bit breezy and there's trees in your scene or moving leaves, those will tend to blur if you're having to go that long of an exposure with it. Obviously, a, a tripod is required for those longer um, those longer times, and the other part is that, that with that dark filter on there, it's, you don't really have the ability to focus while the filter's in place. Uh, you have to get your focus and composition and so forth in that with a filter off, and then put the filter on, and much like you would do with say like a, as I mentioned, a, like a ten stop neutral density filter, um, and then you'll use the the manual camera mode for that. Uh, now the benefits of the camera conversion is, you know, really when I'm when I'm using that camera that's already been converted, I'm pretty much using it the same way that I do my with my standard standard digital uh, camera. Uh, there is the ability to autofocus. Uh, the tripod is not required, although if you want to get longer exposures and put a neutral density filter on there, it's they're certainly capable of doing that. But just for standard shooting and that, it's not really necessary. And then also the ability to, again, photograph moving subjects without that um, long exposure time. Uh, so now we, we talked a little bit about this even before the, the presentation and that, but the DSLR versus the mirrorless. Uh, the DSLR camera does have a few uh, drawbacks to using that as your converted camera. One is that the focal point can often be in front or behind of the intended subject. And typically what they do is when you have your camera uh, converted, you'll send in a lens in this case also in that, and they will calibrate 
that lens specifically to that camera for use for infrared. Um, so then one of your limitations there becomes that you're limited to that particular lens. So if you're gonna go that route, it probably makes sense not to go with a prime lens, uh, but rather one that has a, a range, let's say, in fact, the one I use on my, mine is mirrorless by the way, but one I use a lot is 24 to 120. Um, and that, that gives me a lot of range for, I'll say landscape photography. Um, my, now my understanding too though, is that with a DSLR camera, if you have that converted, if you're in live view, that it will act much like a mirrorless camera. And so maybe that focus issue isn't yeah. quite as much of a problem. Uh, so the mirrorless camera benefits. One is the focal point matches that intended subject. Uh, it doesn't require that calibration of specific lenses. I didn't, when I had mine uh, converted, I didn't have to send in any lenses with that. Uh, added flexibility of using multiple lenses. And then also you have the benefits just that mirrorless cameras provide anyways is the electric viewfinder to have a better understanding of what your exposure is gonna be. Uh, let's see, camera settings. So most of the, the settings that I use are very similar to what I would do with my standard uh, digital uh, camera. Raw capture, just capturing in raw versus JPEG. Uh, histogram. You know, they say exposed to the right. I will say that with my infrared, I tend to not expose quite as far to the right. Sometimes it comes out seemingly a little bit blown out if I go all the way to the right. So I sometimes don't go quite that far out. Uh, standard use of ISO, shutter speed, aperture. Uh, one thing that, that when I set my camera in for a conversion, they set it to a custom white balance. And that was with the Kelvin set way down to 2000. And that's as low as the, the camera uh, white balance will go. So um, I wish I could explain exactly the reason for that, but I, I think it's just the way that infrared captures it. That's a, a more ideal Kelvin uh, white balance temperature than say some of the higher levels that we typically use with our standard color photography. And these slides, I will be moving through more quickly here in a few minutes. The more of the discussion is here on the early phase. Uh, so straight out of camera, uh, this is how it looks, uh, that, that image up there where you can see some of that pinkish uh, tone throughout there. So that's pretty much why I think almost every um, infrared image I take gets some level of post-processing. Uh, one of the challenges is hotspots. Interestingly, in my case, and I've heard this from others too, is that sometimes it's the uh, better, more expensive lenses that are more susceptible to getting these hotspots. And that's exactly what it is with, in my case. I have the, the, these two images that are up there were shot with my um, uh, Nikon Z lens that is a uh, 70 to 200 F 2.8 lens. And my understanding is that some of the higher end lenses that have special you know, added reflective coatings and so forth and that are more vulnerable and susceptible to, to the white spots. Interestingly, the lenses that I have the most luck with are my Nikon 24 to 120 f4 lens. And then I also tend to use my Tamron 150 to 600 lens a lot. And with those, I almost never get the, those hot spots. Another one I don't have a slide up here for, but is um, a challenge can sometimes be dust spots. If you have dust on your sensor, it really does show up in, uh, in infrared. So what causes the hotspot? Is it just something within the lens? It, it, it's something with the way that that infrared light captures and, and with the lens. And if you look on those two images and it's and most of mine, it's right there in the center. The middle. Huh. It, it's, it's right there in the center. And what causes that is somehow it's, like I say, it's, it's, it's the lenses, the high-end lenses, and it's the way that that infrared uh, light reacts with the I'll say anti-reflective coatings in that oh. in the lenses. It's, it's, it, that's the way it's been described to me, but. So would you keep shooting with this lens then for infrared? I, 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 I mean, like, cause how do you fix that? So, so here's how, here's how I fix it is uh, I don't use that lens very often. Now, <laughs> I mean, I, I'd I, be like, okay, I'm not using I, that anymore. <laughs> I, I hardly ever do now for that reason. Okay, on yeah. that, now on my Z7 uh, standard camera that, that I use that lens almost more than anything else, but. And this one here, I don't. So here's here's okay. my tip for that, is I use my uh, 24 to 120 that covers right. some of that range. And then my 150 to 600 Tamron 
that covers most of the other end of that right. room. A little bit of a gap in okay. there. But that's that's my solution. Anyways. Okay. <laughs> At least I have those other lenses, right? Uh, let's see here. Um, so here's just you know one that was like I mentioned earlier. I'll go through some processing items later on. I'll move through these here pretty quick. But this is with uh, the Nick Silver FX Pro and just a mountain scene that I did with um, in infrared. Uh, let's see here. So so again, just real quickly here, the how and why things look different with infrared. Again, some of this I discussed earlier in that when, when a scene is illuminated, some of the light waves are absorbed while others are reflected. And then the luminosity of objects captured in infrared depends on how those objects reflect, ref refract or absorb infrared radiation. So now I'll go through a couple of examples. And these ones I'm going to go through pretty quickly here. On this one, this was a scene up in Rocky Mountain National Park. This was middle of, uh, middle of the morning. I think it was like 10, 30, 11 in the morning. That sky was blue. That water was blue. The trees were normal tree colors. It's not snow on them. There's a little bit of snow back there in the peaks. But you can see how that um, absorbed light in the sky and that absorbed light down in the water go much darker than what we would normally see. And then you can see where, again, the, the plants with the chlorophyll and so forth, what that infrared light does to, does to trees. This one was not infrared, although some of those psychedelic colors kind of show up like that. But this was just fall colors over at a local, um, here in Littleton, Colorado, a local park that I go visit sometimes. And I'm bringing this up just for comparison between that and just moments later, this is what I shot with the uh, infrared camera. So same trees, same day, same morning, but obviously all the colors go and just again, a different it's a different look. It's not initially better, but it's just something that uh, that has a much different look than what you get with the, the standard camera. So now I'll go, kind of go through a, a few of the genres of photography in terms of how infrared um, works with those. I'll start here with the uh, in landscapes because that's that's what I do most of. Uh, and I'll, I'll I'll say that great scenes that are are there in color and standard black and white conversion don't always work as well with infrared, meaning sunrise, sunset, colorful uh, scenes and so forth. That's not always necessarily the best time for infrared. The opposite is also true is scenes that may appear drab in color and black and white might be in, in standard black and white conversions can sometimes be really good cam uh, candidates for infrared. Uh, midday light is often poor for our standard landscape photography. Usually that's the time that you, go rest or whatever in that if you got up super early in the morning to catch sunrise. Whereas with uh, with infrared, midday light can sometimes be some of the best. If you throw midday light and a few clouds in the sky, that can be much better than sunrise or sunset. So that last bullet there is feel free to sleep in. Um, <laughs> unlike this, I mentioned earlier, like this last Sunday morning, I got up at 2.45 a.m. to meet some others and go up and photograph uh, sunrise and photograph wildlife. If I was going out there for the purpose of shooting infrared, I would have slept in much later than that. <laughs> uh, again, uh, here with the uh, the landscapes. So, so what I'm looking for a lot of times, it, and I will say that it, it's it. I'm still learning that pre-visualization because it's so much different than it is for um, other standard photography. But I'm looking for the scenes that provide interesting tonality, a lot a lot of range and. Uh, blues, clouds, um, foliage that I know that those are going to be reflecting light, um, blue skies that are going to be absorbing light. So uh, again, sort of, as I mentioned there on the bottom there, a scenario that has a clear day with some clouds and some trees and some water and those type of things can make a really interesting um, infrared type scenario. I'm just going to go through a couple of uh, examples here, just kind of showing the, the difference. So this was just a morning scene that I shot here in Colorado, sunrise, uh, water, and so forth and that. This is just a standard color image, right? Nothing too special about that. And then on this slide, that scene on the left with that same image just converted to black and white, just standard black and white conversion. And then that one on the right is the infrared conversion. And so same scene, same morning, just different camera with infrared, but you can see what that did to some of the foliage along the foreground. The trees look a little bit different, the sky, and certainly the reflections on the water look much different with that infrared. 
it's not to say one looks better than the other, but they certainly don't don't look the same. And there's no way that with my standard black and white conversion from a regular color image that I could get it to look anything like what I'm seeing there on the right. Uh, here, I'll just go through some real quick examples. This is one that was one of the first images I ever took with my infrared camera. I got it right before I went up to a trip up to um, Grand Teton National Park. So this is overlooking that Snake River Overlook. And again, you can see here what happens with clouds, light, shadows, trees. It's kind of one that, um, like I said, got me interested in it right off, right out of the box, I'll say. Uh, this is a local park here in Littleton, Colorado. Uh, again, you still get good reflections in that with it. Um, you can see there what it's doing to the sky. The trees there in the background in particular, some of the ones with leaves on them, you can see what, you know, that again, bringing out that white, bringing out that contrast in that that's there versus the, when I say contrast, then you look at the darkness that's there in some of the tree trunks over on some of the trees, particularly to the right. Uh, Rocky Mountain National Park. This was mid-morning. This was that sky was blue, and when you look at this, you think that it was nighttime or something really strange or whatever in that. But this is midday. Again, water goes dark, sky goes dark, and the trees take on a, a look of their own with the, the light. Uh, this is Cherry Creek State Park nearby. Just a, again, a reflection, just once again showing, this is a winter scene, so there's no leaves on the trees, but there again, you can see that contrast of the trunk of that tree versus some of the, um, and the, those, those were dormant shrubs that were around that uh, little pond. And then you get that reflection in the clouds reflecting down off of that water. Same place, Cherry Creek State Park, just a path, a couple that was walking along the path back there. But once again, dark, the darkness in the sky, the clouds, the contrast, and the much different look that you can see there with the the, um, the trees. And then the, the green grass on the ground, that's not snow down there, that's just green grass, but the way the, the infrared light picks it up is, is interesting. Michael, are these all with 720? These are all with 720, correct, yes, yeah. I wish I had the full spectrum one. Maybe that's something that I'll add to my, uh, <laughs> I think you mentioned that you have that. So someday I, I'll just have to tell my wife I need one more. <laughs> so um, let's see, this is a Pikes Peak. And that was snow that was up on the top of that. But this, again, midday, no need to get up early. Uh, dark, or uh, I should say a blue sky, a few clouds in the sky. And once again, you get kind of an interesting look that I wouldn't get otherwise. Uh, this was over here at Cherry Creek State Park. Again, you can see there that, and this was just, you know, real dark sky. There was a storm that either had come through or is coming through. I can't remember exactly which. Um, but um, I, again, you can see how white that, that tree in the foreground, some of those trees in the background, some of the stuff that's in the closer foreground and the contrast against that, that real dark sky. Uh, this is just a standard. I, I'm gonna, here's a, a, a comparison. This is the a standard black and white uh, photo from a scene here in a park in Littleton, Colorado. And this is the same scene just moments later, but with the uh, infrared. So once again, if I go back and forth, that's the standard. That's how it looks, just a normal black and white conversion. And there's the uh, infrared look. Plants. I'm going to go through these here pretty quickly. I don't do a lot of this, and there's kind of a reason. Um, this one I thought was interesting, though, but this is dormant plants. I'm not sure exactly what those flowers are, but against a, a blue sky, and uh, again, it, it, it brings out an interesting contrast there. Uh, this was just succulents that have a lot of chlorophyll in them, and you'll see that here in a second. Uh, so that's just, again, just a standard um, black and white, or color, obviously. That's the black and white conversion of it. Um, and that's the infrared conversion of it. So that's cool. It's 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 cool. It's different. I, you yeah. know, to be honest, I sort of like the tonality that this one has in it. Um, maybe yeah. more than this. Uh, hold on. This, but as far as something that's different, it still has a little bit of 
shades here and there and so forth that you know once again it has that real glowy effect but this, this is sort of that an extreme of that example when i mentioned that chlorophyll is a um uh reflects light this is the the um, succulents or something like this is a real good example of that these are just uh, leaves on an ash tree in our backyard but the infra with the infrared you can see the veins in the leaves themselves whereas those wouldn't really show in a standard black and white conversion of a standard image. And then I brought this one up. So this is a tulip. It's a real colorful tulip. And this is when I mentioned earlier at the beginning that there's some scenarios that I think don't necessarily work real well with infrared. And to me, flowers are, are one of those. I've you know tried it a few times and you just don't get very much contrast. It's like the stems are the same color as the flowers, even though in nature, they're much different. So I don't, I tend not to, I've tried it a few times and haven't found anything that grabs my attention to say, let's keep photographing flowers with infrared. So I really don't, don't, but I wanted to bring that in here as an example of kind of why I don't do it. Uh, trees are interesting infrared. So this is just a standard, uh, I was over at a local park one morning and this couple of women were walking and their dogs were sort of wrestling, I guess, over there or whatever. They were chasing each other around. But um, th these are just some trees. It was a snowy scene, fence in the winter. And same trees moments later, shot with the infrared, again, with a cloudy sky, snow on the ground. You kind of see a, a different look to it. And this is the same trees, different day from a different angle. But again, you can see what, um, you know, what that, what that, what that contrast and what that, that infrared light does to, in particular, trees, skies, and shrubs, and whatnot. This, th this tree was actually yellow. This was fall colors just here in Highlands Ranch at a local park, and uh, just with a bench in front of it. But again, it was blue sky, uh, yellow leaves on those trees, but that's how they came out in infrared. The moon is a, a, a good, subject for infrared photography so this and and i'll say this is that with infrared a lot of times moon photography is best like right at full moon when it's on the horizon and there's a little bit of light in the foreground and so forth what i found is that with infrared it actually works better if it's a day or two before the full moon or a day or two after in that um, the moon up against a blue sky gives you this contrast that here you can see the details in that. You can see some of the details in some of the rest of the scene that to me, it, it works a little bit better sometimes than on the day of the full moon itself. And this is a different day, same tree, same moon, I guess, just different. Day. But uh, I guess it's always the same. It's always the same moon, huh? <laughs> but, again, but again, you see some of the uh, the detail in it and it's coming in just on, it was, oh, it says moon, Right, a moon set because it was morning so the moon was setting and i had to wait for it to dip down below those clouds but same tree just a different perspective i think this was with that uh 150 to 600 lens so i, I use that one a lot for my um the moon photography and this one was on a full moon so this was at the full moon as it was dipping under uh the horizon off in a distance with the at 600 millimeters i think i probably had that set up Clouds are another good example in that, again, you get this interesting contrast when you have, especially when you have clouds that have some darkness in them and then some of the light hitting some of them. Again, you get, you get this real interesting contrast that takes place. So is that shot out of a plane window? No, no, this was, this was shot um, from my backyard, actually. Just I, I pointed the camera up towards the clouds that were up there. So, oh. so I was on at ground level and I was looking up towards that. I wasn't up at a plane looking down at that. So can you say again on that, on the full on the full moon, you usually find that it's best a few days before, a few days after. A, and, a day or two, yep. Oh, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Uh -huh. And after, uh, and you said against a blue sky. So are you shooting it like, uh, I'm not quite understanding that. Yeah, so so think about this is that um, a lot of times when, when the full moon, on the very full moon day, you know, it's, it's, it's right on the horizon and sometimes you'll get a little bit of like color and so forth and that that goes along with a full moon and in full moon photography. The day or two beforehand, let's see here. So 
I'm trying to let me think about the timing of it. The day or two beforehand, it's going to be at moon set. So it'll be at night. No, moon rise, excuse me. When the moon is rising, um, it will be rising and the sky will be blue. Whereas when the moon is rising on the full moon, right when it gets above the sur above the ground horizon, uh, it, it's already the sky is already dark. Whereas oh. a couple of days beforehand, that sky is blue as it's raising up, and then the sky gets dark, and then the moon is in the dark. It's during that period where the sky is blue, or it's at least it's not super dark, that you get. Um, the contrast that I had in uh, these scenes like this, like that, that was like two days or so before, but this was, at, at, this was two days after full moon because it was moon set. So it was in the morning. Okay. And then the last one where it's really dark. That one. Yeah. Yeah. That So that was at, on, on a full moon. This was like the full moon day and you can see how the sky is much darker. You get, you get a lot of contrast, but um, yeah. the, the sky was much darker there, but, the, the the day or two before or after you get a w w let's put it this way if you photograph the moon against a blue sky two days beforehand or two days after a full moon there just isn't very much contrast and even if i convert that to black and white from a color you just don't get very much contrast whereas infrared you do it it, it really uh -huh. pops out i don't know did that answer your question Does that help yes it did thank you great thanks uh, so there's the clouds, a couple more clouds. This was Cherry Creek State Park, like right in the midst of uh, a storm that had just passed through. Um, again, just it, it, the, the light just gets treated a little bit differently in that with the, the infrared. Uh, this was from our backyard um, off in the distance, but there was a nice storm system coming through, but you can see what happens there with the, um, the clouds, the trees, uh, and then you can see some of the the blue sky above that, how dark that went. This was like in the day. This wasn't, you know, at some odd time of day or anything like that. Uh, this was it um, up in uh, Wyoming, Grand Teton National Park, I think it's at Mount Moran there in the background. So what's interesting about this one is when I, I photographed the same scene with my color uh, camera converted to black and white, but it was this infrared one where you can kind of see some of those wispy kind of misty clouds in the say mid ground foreground or whatever. Those didn't even appear anywhere in the, the other um, camera and the conversions and so forth, but the infrared picked up that kind of interesting light there. Uh, I'm going to go through this one here real quickly on photographing people because I, while I do photograph people uh, with standard cameras, I don't do much of it in infrared, so I'll do it pretty quickly here. This is probably a reason why not a lot of professional headshots are done with infrared. Um, it, it just provides some unique, interesting results. The infrared light penetrates the first two millimeters into the skin. So white skin tends to go kind of glowy and it makes, a, makes it glow a bit. And then there's a contrast there if there's any veins and so forth and parts of the skin, then they go dark. So it kind of be, can almost look creepy at times. Um, so I'll, I'll bring up just a few people examples. This is just standard color and standard black and white conversion of a person. And this was the same person, but in infrared. Uh, you can see just the effects throughout. Uh, same person, but in infrared. Again, you can kind of see that contrast of her darker hair against the leaves in the background and the skin gets sort of a little bit of a glowy effect. Uh, same person actually, but just... You can see here what, like the red fabric went white. Uh, and one thing I'll point out too is the skin gets kind of that glowy look. But the one thing, and you can see it here, is the eyes go super dark. Mm -hmm. And so they say that um, when you're, if you're photographing and interested in photographing people with infrared, you want to either like re make sure the, the sun is getting right onto the eye area or reflect, use a reflector to reflect light into there or use a ring light or something like that to enhance that because otherwise you get sort of that creepy look that um, <laughs> that you have with that. And same thing, uh, this one, the eyes weren't quite as dark but she was looking towards the sun. So that's why I was able to not have quite as uh, dark, not as much darkness under the, the eyes. Animals, I don't have a lot of animal images or not, at least not in this presentation, but I'll go through these here real quickly. You have to get a 
couple pictures of our dog. So our, our, our German shepherd here, he's, uh, his eyes sort of glow there with the infrared. He's jumping up after whatever's left of, a, I think, a football or something. Um, the part that he hadn't chewed off yet. And that's how he looks in color. So you get the, the the difference of how he looks in color versus how that infrared looks. So I, I, I don't find the infrared particularly interesting for animals. Um, and same thing with birds. This was a bald eagle that was flying overhead. I photographed that. This was a, a hawk. But again, same thing. It, did, it, it doesn't really do anything for me. So when I mentioned that I was going to bring up images that where infrared maybe isn't the, the right choice. I'd say animals, birds, I haven't found a great use for them, but maybe I'll just have to keep trying. Uh, real quick, a few of them here on architecture. Um, just downtown Denver. This was, I wanna say early morning and that cloudy. So it might not be a great example, but you can see it really doesn't look too much different probably than a standard black and white conversion would have in this scene, but there are times where it looks a bit different. Uh, this one is uh, just windows that was a building. I just happened to be looking for symmetry and caught this one. And what was interesting here is that the windows did go into a pretty dark. They didn't go totally black, but they go pretty dark. So again, you get some of that contrast in that scene. Uh, this is Denver, just the Denver skyline from a, a point of view on a cloudy day. But again, here, you know, the things that are interesting is just kind of, you know, again, lights and shadows on the buildings that's a little bit different than what that will look like if I do a standard black and white conversion, not too much different. But then um, again, you know, if you have other things in the scene such as trees and clouds and those type of things and that, it kind of adds a little bit more interest to it. Uh, the downtown Capitol building, uh, I just, again, was walking around uh, when I was working downtown with my infrared camera, just looking for scenes and came across this. And again, you get some of that contrast. It was in the winter time, so there are no leaves on those trees. Interestingly, if you look back in the background at the flags, a lot of times fabrics and fabrics with dyes on them tend to lose any of that um, design. It, it just, they go somewhat white, similar to that. Uh, again, just sort of demonstrating once again, some of the contrast, just light hitting the side of the building a blue sky back in the background going real dark and just the way the light's hitting some of these statues, structures, whatever we want to call them there in the foreground. Just a few more slides left here. This was that same day. I just took a picture of the up above at the building. And then there was a reflection that was coming down. That's what that stuff is down there on the bottom. Um, just was looking more for texture and uh, symmetry on that. And then this one, I, the interesting thing about this one is this is a, a statue that's out near our Denver Performing Arts Center. And this was middle of the day, blue sky. Those, sta those statues are white, but again, if I take that with my standard camera and try and convert it to black and white, it's really hard to get that, that, that contrast and that, that sky to go as dark as what the infrared picked it up as. Uh, just a real quick slide here on, I mentioned it earlier there, as far as my post-processing. Um, again, I capture them all in, in RAW, and then I go into, you know, and when I have in here Lightroom and Photoshop, really they just start, the, the image just is in those, just from one to the next without any real adjustments. It's really over in that Nick Silver FX Pro that I'm making most of my adjustments. And then, as I mentioned earlier too, and that I've lately been also using Capture One, it has some some ability to adjust color channels and so forth within there to, to create some unique effects also with them, the infrared images. And with that, that that's the end of the, the, the formal presentation. This was just a scene there in uh, downtown Denver, where again, you kind of see, you know, just kind of what it's doing with a street photography scene, uh, where there's some of these plants that were along the side, cloudy sky fabric up there. Um, there's no place like Larimer. I guess that's, I guess there truly is no place like Larimer. It's a <laughs> popular place there in downtown Denver. So, um, so, th so that's what I had. If, if awesome. we have a couple of minutes, I can show a real quick two, three minute demo on, you know, post-processing an image 
Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, we have, I mean, we have like six minutes till it's an hour. I mean, if we okay. go a little over, that's fine, you know. Okay. But, okay. Um, are you guys interested in seeing some post processing of a, of a, okay, we'll go ahead and do that then. Okay, it'll take me just a second. I think I yeah, not a problem. Stop share. Do I stop share? Problem. And and, and I'll, I'll I'll roll through this one here real quickly. Uh, let's see here. This. I think I already have it queued up. Did, did cool. that come up? Yep. So a scene in Rocky Mountain National Park. This is as 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 we saw earlier in that you get that uh, that kind of pinkish tone and so forth in that throughout the scene like this. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to I'm, I'm I've done like no adjustments. You can already see a couple of dust stuff bots in there. I don't know if you <laughs> thing in there, but I mentioned earlier that that's an issue. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just go straight from that. I'm going to go. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, no. um, oh, filter. Sorry about that. I should know this. I have Nick, and I'm going to go to Nick Silver Effects Pro. Yeah, Chuck just made a comment. He said infra infrared makes the photos interesting, but it's it's your composition that makes the photos compelling. Oh, uh -huh. and, and that's the that's sure. going to be the case in in any in a lot of, of landscape or a lot right, of or right or landscape or if you're doing infrared or if you're doing something else that's unusual. Right. Um, you know, right. I mean, that's in my opinion, and I try to like grill this into people, but mm -hmm. composition, in my opinion, is the very most important thing. Mm -hmm. of a photo right because if you don't have a decent composition it doesn't mm -hmm. matter if it's technically correct or really, if it's like I, really cool looking for some other reason you know the, the composition is what draws people in yep those, those are great so points. right yeah right e excellent point and i don't know that i nailed the composition right on this one but it, for, for this purpose i think it, it it does okay in that um it's that that's uh long's peak back in the background that's a fourteen thousand foot peak in rocky mountain national park for whatever that's worth. Um, this was fall colors. In fact, uh, yeah, I won't go back to it, but I have a, a an image of the same one in color. Um, and and I don't know, for those that are not familiar with uh, Silver Effects Pro or- Did you, you open, are, Nick? Did you open it? Yeah, is it not Okay, because now we're, I still see Photoshop. Uh, is it on no. your other screen? Okay, here, I'm gonna do that. I didn't realize that it- um, It may have opened on the other screen or open. Sorry about that. What's up? Oh. No, it's fine. Let me see if that. Okay, here. Um, I didn't realize that the Nick. There you go. Is that there? Okay. Yep. Let me make sure that uh, this will be. That's weird. Okay, so what I'll do here is. Um, so I may have to jump around a little bit. So, so those that are familiar with Silver Effects Pro, um, it has its kind of presets over there. Right. And, and the one that I and try any of these ones, you know, experiment obviously and so forth and that, but the one that I found works pretty good. I make a couple of adjustments to it, but it's the high structure harsh. Mm. And when that one pops up, it does that. Did that, did that come through? Yep. And then what I'll do with this is I'll play around with it a little bit. Sometimes it's like a little bit too crunchy. So I take that right. structure down a little bit, maybe half of what it comes up as and take some of that crunchiness out of it. And then, and then sometimes I will play around with a contrast if it feels like it needs a little bit more. And the other one that I do sometimes is in the color channels, I take this blue one, this blue color filter, and it makes it really dark, but then I take the strength of it down to about something like that. And if that's so that still, just that just affects the blues in the image. And yeah, yeah, and blue. And, and, right. Okay. And, and darkens them. So it, in right. a sense, it's also is giving some of the um, the 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 contrast and and right, right. So, and, and if that made it overall too dark i can go up here to the brightness and pick that up a little bit depending upon where we want that at and really it's pretty much i i won't i usually don't do too much more than that i mean obviously you can do different things sepia tone or some of these other kind of things in it and so forth but i usually you know that right there is i'd say in 80 percent of my images the adjustments are not too much different from that and and I won't go. F what I'll do is, and then I'll hit apply. And I'm wondering if now it's going to, did it did it now bounce me? Well, to, yeah. Now we, now we you have to share your screen with yeah, let me, the other screen with Photoshop if you're going to do anything else there. And and, and, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to make it real quick here. Let me see if it'll do this here. Where's my Photoshop one? But you know what? I wonder. But now it's picking up that Photoshop. Oh uh, right. Uh, 
I, so it didn't pick up that because it went back and forth. It didn't pick up that. So it didn't carry that silver fix pro. Oh, so I, I, won't, okay. I won't go into, I'll just sort of describe what the next step is. And that is clean up those dust spots that. Yeah. That <laughs> and, um, and then, and then the last step I will do oftentimes too, is um, I will go into uh, uh, what is the name of that Topaz denoise and yeah. just with the Topaz denoise sliders, a little bit of the, uh, the, the denoise filter and a little bit of the sharpening filter on uh, the, the sliders, I should say, right? And the denoise and hit apply and then and then it's done. But I, for the sake of time, I won't go through and do all those because I have to bounce back and forth. Right? No, that's okay. Screen. So, so with that, and, I mean, if somebody really wanted, we could always do a short, you know, presentation where you walk us through step by step or something yeah, yeah. in right, more right. detail, you know. Yeah. Yep. Uh, for post processing. Exactly. Yeah. Um, no, I'd, I'd be happy to to do that sometime. If and 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 or and, you know, we, you could write an article with that in it. We, we, <laughs> I am I am overdue for a couple of articles. So I can do, do one of those here pretty quickly. Um, but and and I was going to say too, if anybody has any questions, and if we don't cover those here tonight, or if you come up with a question later on, feel free to reach out to me anytime. I can. Yeah, if you're in the community, either post it in the community or you can private message uh, Mike, uh, Michael, or myself or whatever, and uh, one of us will see it and get back to you. Um, and the replay of this will be posted in the community probably tomorrow. Um, so you can rewatch it if you want. Um, so, uh, Nick, just to back up, so you use Nick, yeah. uh, Nick uh, software, and it was which one of those? It was the Silver yeah. Effects? Yeah, it's, so, D, so, it's DXO, Nick, actually now. Yeah, just, DXO. Just to clarify. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just, yeah. And yeah, then, yeah. Oh, okay, sure. And then the Topaz Denoise. And what was the last one sharpening? So, yeah. So here's what it is is the, the Nick Silver. And, and the Nick has like a Color Effects Pro that I also use a lot for some of the color images. Nick Silver Effects for my black and white conversions. And then uh, your last question was uh, on the uh, Topaz Denoise. There's a topaz denoise and a topaz sharpening programs, and I have both of those. I tend to a lot of times use the denoise, and in the denoise, it has a slider to um, reduce noise. And so I'll move that slider, I think, usually about 15 to 20 or so, something like that, depending upon how much noise there is in the image. And then it has a it has a slider on there also with a um, uh, with sharpening. And I'll move that slider also somewhere 15, 20, something like that. And it helps with some of the sharpening. Okay, thank you. Cool. Does anybody have any other questions? Comments? That was awesome. Oh, I, I, like, have one, I have one, yeah. one little thing about the hotspots. Um, I've been told um, in some one-on-one -on -one training that the hotspots are more pronounced if you um, go down to like, if you go to like F22, because you're really hyper focusing on a spot, and that's when your hot spots uh, become really oh, okay, right. But okay. if you shoot a more wide open, it helps minimize the hot spot issue. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you. That 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 is helpful in two ways. Mm -hmm. One is when you go down to like F eighteen, F twenty two. If that's if that's a, an issue that causes hot spots, that's good to know. And the other thing is when you go to F eighteen, F twenty two, those dust spots really show. So dust spots <laughs> become really. Um, visible when you go into those um those higher and, and that's not just for infrared photography that's, that's for right. any photography and so forth when you go into those if you have any dust spots on your sensor at all they're amplified or magnified or whatever and so forth when you go into those um tighter uh, apertures so but okay. if that's a hot spot issue too that's good to know i just yeah there's, there's never any i learned that from dan wampler at life pixel um, they okay. did my okay. conversion, and he yep. does amazing, really wonderful one-on-ones. If you okay. need a tutorial, great, great, and uh, yeah, Life Pixel. That, when I mentioned that I did mine through Spencer's, I know Life Pixel is, I think, the other really um, well-known one that a lot of people. I, I know others that have gone through that uh, yeah. company. But if conversion. you get stuck with processing too, um, in other issues of uh, doing a thirty-minute one-on-one with Dan is very helpful. Oh, great. Right. Saves a, it saves a lot of anxiety and time trying to figure it out. Frust yourself. Frustration. Sure. And then they record, your, your session is recorded, so you don't have to take notes. You know? Oh, good, good. No, that's good to know. That's that's great to know. Um, cool. One of the other ones, too, is uh, Kalari Vision. Yeah. Okay. And yeah. They, they, 
they were one of the few that had kind of lower priced point point and shoots that were already converted, like little Nikons and stuff like that. That like might be a hundred and some dollars, but like they're already converted. So, so I mean, if somebody was interested, that might be a gateway to you know see if they would like to do that. That's a, that's a good point. I because I would be like, I'm not going to spend the money yeah. on on a whole system, but if you can go buy a mm. point and shoot for a hundred bucks to yeah, play and, with like i would do that just to play with in the life pixel like the few that i've had converted there if you wait till the end of the year they usually have an end of the year sale mm. and, and like you can get like 20 percent off so yeah they know. have they have our pre uh, pre-converted cameras also right. so. cool and, use, and used ones so there's lots okay. of choices out there okay that, that's good to know and yeah, that was one of um uh uh Lori's questions early on was it can you go and buy these cameras off the shelf versus having to buy mm -hmm. one and convert it and so forth. So it sounds like Kalari Vision, that's who you said. Um, yeah, Kalari Vision. And there's a lot of people on eBay that do them, but again, you're taking your chances. Right, right. right. And, and uh, the other thing I found that's interesting too is uh, silhouettes. Silhouettes and infrared are pretty interesting because like, you get a lot more contrast. Mm. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, that. That's a good point. I, I I should I didn't include it in here, but I have a, a silhouette at like sunrise with the sun rising behind our Denver skyline, and it was really interesting. The, the light hit like a couple of prominent buildings, but the rest of it really went like you say, real contrasty. So the buildings really silhouetted against the sky, and it's a, a different look than I was able to get with the um the other camera with a, just a standard black and white mm. conversion, right? I also like playing around shooting colorful things to see what it looks like in infrared. Like I went to the beach and all the different color umbrellas, all the different bathing suits, everybody was in white. <laughs> you know, like the, yeah, yeah, that, all white. I took right. pictures of like a train conductor in the striped uniform. He looked like a painter. <laughs> you know, <just laughs> right, 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 right. It's 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 interesting, and and that's why I say sometimes the the pre visualization takes a little while to get used yeah. to on what what's going to be the impact like i say I, I tried to several times with flowers thinking oh this would be kind of yeah. neat because there's you know the the contrast of a red versus the yellow or whatever and so forth and you take the picture and like the red looks almost the same as the yellow as looks like the stem the green stem it all just kind of blends together and not not very impressive but um i don't know like i say it, it, it's fun to experiment with and see what you get because the more i do it the more i'm starting to get sort of an idea that pre-visualization what that scene is going to look like in black and white, but I still get surprised plenty of times. And like even your camera bags that are black, they're treated to with UV reflectors, and 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 that so like you take a picture of your camera bag and it's like white with like dark straps. <laughs> it's like because right. they don't want the heat to to penetrate into your supplies. Right. Right. Oh, good point. Right. <laughs> Interesting. Cool. Well, that that was awesome. I learned a ton because I've never really delved into it. It's never been like a thing that I paid much attention to. Um, yeah, it was very interesting. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Oh, thank you. Thank you. So, but like I said, if, I, I've enjoyed it. It's it's it 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 now is a big part of whenever I go out on my you know landscape photography outings and so forth. And that it's I, I I try to make sure I bring this along with it. And and don't get me wrong, I still really enjoy the colors and the scenes and you know, Colorado here, we get, we're not too right, far away right. the fall colors where we get the aspens that turn yellow and all right. that. It, I don't want to leave the color camera behind, but um, the infrared one is fun to bring along with. So, Cool. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thanks very much for doing that. Uh, it, was, it was a great. Yeah, no, thank you if, uh, anybody have any other questions or comments? Tom, did you have something else you wanted to say? No, I said it was awesome. I was thrilled. I was thrilled to see that that was the topic for tonight. I was like, this is great. And if there's any other topics you guys have that you want to, um, brought up or people to talk about, um, I can try to get you know whoever it may or may not be a, a photo focus author. Um, I have, you know, we have other contacts that maybe if people are interested in doing presentations, we can do that. Um, on other subjects. So just direct message me in the community or email me at laurie at photofocus.com and uh, we'll we'll try to do a variety of topics here. Um, and we can go back to, you know, when we started doing these hangouts, we were doing some critiques 
Mm -hmm. um, kind of trying to help people out with their images. So, you know, next month, I think that may, but may be what we do, just an informal kind of hangout because um, it's been a couple months since we've done anything like that. So um, that's the sort of a plan. <laughs> so they're, they're all fun i enjoy them so. and if that's it then uh we'll wrap up say good night to everybody thank you guys for showing up we appreciate it Thanks and, for doing uh, it. thank we'll you see, everyone. Uh, see you next month great thank yeah. you take care bye thanks bye, bye.